Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about this very interesting study that might have identified clues of the mysterious axions, the particles that were predicted several decades ago and that might also help us explain a lot of things in the universe, including the mystery of dark matter. And although the results themselves are not really verified by other studies yet and might also have some other explanations, it's still a very interesting study and a very interesting discovery. So let's discuss this in more detail, starting with axions? What are axions? Like so many other things in physics, this one actually starts with an unresolved mystery or unresolved problem in particle physics. And the idea here is behind what's known as symmetry. Now, symmetry is basically just a mirror image of something. The best example here would be the symmetry observed in electrons and their antiparticles known as positrons. For example, if an electron and a positron are created, they'll usually have what's known as the parity symmetry. One will be left-handed, one will be right-handed. Then we have another type of symmetry for electrons and for anything with electromagnetic force. And that's called charge symmetry, where a positron will have a positive charge, an electron will have a negative charge. And together they create what's known as CP symmetry, which is in essence the electron and the positron. And this is something that does actually make sense, but a lot of physicists early on assume that this is true of any kind of a particle and antiparticle. In other words, a lot of scientists initially assumed that, for example, if we were to take a proton and an antiproton, you would have a very similar sort of situation where you have two symmetrical particles. But as I mentioned in one of the previous videos, at some point we discovered that the weak force doesn't have this symmetry. For some reason, the weak force has what's known as CP violation. And this, of course, eventually led to the Nobel Prize and a lot of really interesting propositions. And basically, there's a whole video about it. But what's even more unusual is that because of this proposition, it was also assumed that there should be a similar type of a CP violation when it comes to other forces and other particles. And by the way, you can read more about this CP violation and a lot of these ideas in the blog post I'm posting in the description below, written by this wonderful person who also created the images I just used. And anyway, long story short, it was assumed that CP violation would be also true of anything related to the strong force. In other words, the scientists believed that maybe only electromagnetic force, only electrons and positrons, would be symmetric where everything else would be not symmetric. But it turns out, for some reason, the strong force, or the strongest of the fundamental forces, is symmetrical after all. But theoretically and mathematically, no one can actually explain it. And today this is known as the strong CP problem, and it's essentially one of the biggest mysteries, unsolved mysteries in physics, and is one of the major problems that no one can explain. But one of the explanations, or at least one of the more likely propositions, was this right here. I'm going to assume that it's pronounced Pexay Quinn theory, but because I've never met those people, I don't really know how they pronounce their names. So my apologies if you're watching this. Anyway, long story short again, to try to explain this symmetry problem, the scientists here propose that, well, you can actually explain everything if there is a hypothetical particle that's produced when the strong force interactions happen. Now, in particle physics, that's often the explanation for a lot of things, a new particle, and in many cases, this has been kind of proven. For example, the so-called Higgs boson that was discovered not so long ago was one of these hypothetical particles that were proposed a long time ago. And so here, to explain these symmetrical properties of certain quarks and anti-quarks and certain other particles, the scientists proposed a particle known as axion. A particle that, at least mathematically, would resolve anything and would solve this CP problem once and for all. And for many years, a lot of scientists actually agreed with this proposition. Axions made a lot of sense, mathematically everything kind of added up, and what's even more interesting here is that, at the same time, these axions would once and for all solve the problem of dark matter. Because if axions indeed existed, they would also be produced in such amounts that it would definitely explain the dark matter that we can't seem to find anywhere. And so naturally, the scientists decided to try to discover this particle. A lot of experiments have been conducted since, I guess, 1977, since the original proposition. And a lot of them were trying to discover these mysterious axions that would actually solve two problems at once. The problem of not seeing dark matter and the problem of CP symmetry, also known as strong CP problem. The first and I guess the most famous such experiment is this one right here, the experiment known as ADMX. But even after a few decades, nothing so far has been found. And the question here is, how come? Why not? Where's this particle? 
And I guess some people and some scientists would instantly say, well, this is a waste of money, there's probably no such particle, and we're not really going to find anything here. But that's a very premature conclusion, simply because of what we know about other particles such as neutrinos. Neutrinos are these very strange particles that were initially proposed back in 1930s, and they're denoted as this letter right here. These particles have a very peculiar property in that they don't actually interact with a lot of matter. They only interact with things through the weak force. And also they exert a little bit of gravity. But at the same time they move really fast, close to the speed of light, and they seem to go through most of the matter. In this picture they're created in the middle of the star and they easily go through the star, not interacting with any of the matter on the way. And because of this, it took a long while for the scientists to finally confirm the existence of neutrinos. As a matter of fact, it took almost 30 years. And their confirmation led to the Nobel Prize, because theoretical prediction here and the actual physical proof of the existence was a big deal. But just like with the neutrinos, the proposition for axions also suggests that they're extremely small, have very very small mass, and they also don't interact with anything except for through the weak force once again. But in this case, the predictions suggest that their interactions are even less pronounced than the neutrinos, meaning that they're going to be even more difficult to discover and to confirm. And worst of all, their actual mass, or basically what we're going to be looking for, is currently unknown. Nobody actually knows what to look for and how to find them. But because of all of the previous experiments, we now are pretty sure what they're not. In other words, certain masses have already been eliminated because nothing was discovered. But unlike neutrinos, axions seem to have a very interesting property that can help us discover them. That property is connected to their interaction with the magnetic force. The theory here predicts that if you were to place an axion into a strong magnetic field, it will actually turn this axion into a relatively high frequency light, or basically high energy light, for example, x-rays. And so, for example, if we look at something that has a magnetic field, such as our sun, and if we start seeing x-rays or some other high energy light coming from these regions, it might indicate that what we're looking at is essentially the creation of these unusual axions and their interaction with the field itself. But using our sun for this is a little bit difficult because it produces so many different things and this data can be interpreted in different ways. We have to find something that has a high magnetic field but doesn't actually produce a lot of other energy that doesn't really have a lot of exciting things going on. In other words, we need to find something boring, something not very active with a magnetic field. And it just so happens that there are seven such objects. And here is a small image of one of them. These objects are known as the Magnificent Seven, sort of named after the old western from the 60s. And each of these boring objects is a neutron star. But it's not a pulsar, it's not a magnetar, it's just a neutron star completely by itself that doesn't seem to possess anything around it and doesn't seem to create a lot of exciting or powerful energy. And as of today, we found seven such objects at a distance of about 400 to maybe 1500 light years away from planet Earth. All seven of them are individual neutron stars that are slowly cooling down, doing nothing else in the process. They're all relatively young neutron stars, they're under 1 billion years old, because after this they're going to become pretty much invisible to us. But because we can still see them, and because we know neutron stars have very powerful magnetic field, studying these neutron stars is extremely important to study these various effects around strange objects with very powerful magnetic fields. Now we know that pretty much most neutron stars will have a very powerful magnetic field, with the strongest one being around a magnetar, but even a typical pulsar like Vela Pulsar will have extremely strong magnetic interactions. We've seen this many many times. And so because of this we kind of understand what should be happening around these stars. But because these seven stars are so quiet and, well, technically kind of boring, discovering something unusual around them, that's when things become more interesting. And that's kind of what the scientists whose paper you can find in the description below discovered when they were trying to study these seven neutron stars by using the XMM Newton Observatory that essentially specializes in X-ray radiation. But quickly back to axions. We know that axions can be produced inside stars. We also know that there is a certain effect inside neutron stars that should be also producing a lot of axions as well, at least theoretically. And we also know that when an axion leaves the neutron star or anything that has a magnetic field, it should then interact with the magnetic field, creating relatively powerful radiation such as X-rays. And it just so happens that all seven of these, the magnificent seven neutron stars, were producing extra X-rays 
and these extra x-rays could easily be explained if this was actually axions producing them. Although the scientists in this paper do actually say that we need a lot more studies first, and this is not really conclusive yet. This is only a preliminary finding. And because these extra x-rays have no good explanation just yet, it kind of makes sense to investigate them in more detail. Now, of course, it's possible that something else is producing these extra x-rays. Maybe it's from some other objects we're not seeing in the system. But because all seven seem to be producing them, that's kind of mysterious. That's very difficult to explain. At the same time, since we know that neutron stars cool down by emitting neutrinos, in other words, they have a lot of neutrinos coming from inside of them, it would sort of make sense that something else was happening inside and producing some sort of other particle that was then producing these extra x-rays. And so far, the theoretical proposition of axions makes the most sense here. And if this is the observation of the mysterious axions, it can actually solve a lot of mysteries at the same time. Dark matter, obviously, CP symmetry, but also the mystery of FRBs or fast radio bursts. There are several propositions that suggest that axions coming from within magnetars could definitely produce fast radio bursts. For pretty much the same reasons as the X-ray observations from the magnificent seven neutron stars. But all of this is still very preliminary and it will probably take a few years before we can discover what's really happening here. Until then, check out the paper in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, and share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. And also thank you so much for all of your wonderful support, all of the wonderful comments, and thank you to all of you wonderful Patreon supporters as well. If you'd like to help this channel grow, check out the Patreon or consider supporting this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.